If you're this morning, would you turn to your neighbor and say, hello? Come on. Come on. If you're watching online, welcome. We love you. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Uh, can I show you a couple pictures of my family? There's uh, my lovely wife and my son Judah. He's uh, a little over a year and a half, if you... But that's more realistic of what uh, was going down when trying to take pictures. And the next one. So those of you with toddlers, you, you know we got a couple good pictures out of them with bribery with a lot of snacks. Um, right now he says snack like, knack! So when he yells, knack! Those who are in the nursery, you know he's crazy. So pray for us. We also have a little girl coming the end of this month. So we are beyond excited for that uh, and all that brings. Uh, when we found out that we were pregnant with a girl, the first thing my wife turned to me and said is, you're done, you're ruined, you're done for. So I'm a pushover as it is, and so a little girl uh, <laughs> in my life is going to ruin me. So uh, just take all my money, take my truck, uh, take whatever you want. Um, so... But honored to be with you this morning. Continuing our series, uh, we are New Hope, kind of our DNA as we look forward to what God has for our church. And I am talking about how we are disciples. We are disciples. Turn to your neighbor and say, disciple. We are talking about what it means this morning to be a disciple of Jesus. And, and that word, it might bring to your mind many different things, or discipleship might come to your mind, and that brings to life many different things as well. But I am, my prayer for this morning, and prayer for us, is that we, we would look at what being a disciple meant for Jesus, so that would help us truly understand what it means to be a disciple today, as we look in. So join me as we pray quick, Jesus. Would your spirit move in this place? God, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that um, you're going to speak, God. Move through these words. They are not mine, they're yours, Jesus. And so we, we just invite you to however you want to move. We thank you in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen. You know, if you were to ask anyone outside of church what the word disciple meant or what they thought of when they heard about disciple, outside of church, there would probably be a plethora of different answers. It's not really, disciple is not really a word that functions well outside of the church. It really is for church people or for cults. That's where you hear disciple being said. And so I, I want to break down exactly what it means for us. It is a church word. It's a Bible word, uh, a main theme in the New Testament, especially for Jesus and, and uh, serving Jesus. And so, uh, disciple in scripture, we like to use words like follower or believer uh, as interchangeable, but actually, disciple in scripture, by definition, is more accurately represented by the word apprentice. Turn your neighbor and say, apprentice. Apprentice. And uh, if you think of apprentice today, if you were uh, wanting to become a plumber and you wanted to plumb a house, yes, that is a word. The word is, the verb is plumb. So you're welcome. Go and use that this week. Plumb your house. And if you wanted to join an apprenticeship to be a plumber, there was multiple things that you were signing up for. You were signing up to be around uh, your teacher, you were signing up obviously to learn and, and learn the, uh, from your, whoever's your journeyman or whatever, but also you were, you were becoming into a plumber, you were changing into a plumber, and then ultimately to go and do, go and plumb, go and be a plumber, that was the goal, and that's what an apprenticeship is for us, and when we look at scripture and how Jesus uh, and what disciple really means, it's more, it's more accurate, accurately represented as apprentice rather than just follower. And so um, when we think of disciples, it's easy to quickly think of Jesus, but in Jewish culture, in history, in context, Jesus was by far not the first rabbi, not the first person to have disciples. There was many others before his time, and it was actually the discipleship kind of program, if you will, or the way of teaching and training was a staple to Jewish culture, uh, and it was a formal part of their education. It was well known. It was a part, it, a part of their DNA, and, and I'm just going to go full nerd on you for like five minutes, and I'm, I want to break down uh, their education levels, and uh, once again, ultimately to help us fully understand what it means to be a disciple. And so uh, I apologize for the pronouncing of these 
Jewish or, or Hebrew words because um, I'm American. So, uh, number one, uh, grade school for Jews of that time uh, was called Beit Sefer. It was pronounced, or it means house of the book. Then, like I said, this was grade school when they were very young and little. And this is where uh, they would learn uh, how to read, how to write, and how to memorize. And they would all do that by reading, writing, and memorizing the Torah. They would memorize scripture. That's what they would do. And that was called Beit Sefer. And, and they would do that up until right around the age of 10 years old. And then there was a next level of study that was a little bit deeper called Beit, uh, Beit Talmud. And this was from 10 to 12 years old. Um, so just a couple years that they would go through this um, deeper level, level of study. And they would focus on the oral interpretations of the Torah. So they would have already known and memorized and studied. And now they're focusing on the oral interpretations. Kind of what it means more for our life, for their lives at that time. Um, the majority of Jewish children would stop here. They would get to these two levels, and at 12 or 13 years old, majority percentage would stop at this level of schooling. And they would go into the trade, or most likely whatever their family business was, or, or something like that. They wouldn't go any farther in their studies. The next level was called Beit Talmud, or I mean, excuse me, Beit Midrash, or Beit Talmudim. And, and this was... A, a, a whole nother level of fully understanding and applying the Torah to your daily life. And it would, it would look like there would be a rabbi, uh, there would be a teacher, and, and, and he would go, you would go through a rigorous testing, and he would do an interview process, and he's finding out, can, are you worthy to be my disciple? Can I train you? Are you teachable? Ultimately, are you going to be able to become like me? Then, in some, do you have the capacity at some point that I can send you out ultimately that you would be a rabbi? There was a small percentage of people that actually got to be a disciple under a rabbi. It would be considered a huge honor. And in fact, in that culture, if you, if you trained under a rabbi in Beit Talmudim or Beit uh, Midrash, you would be known in the culture of that time, you would be known to have formal education. People would know, all right, he's educated. He's not just a part of a trade or this or that. He's not just a fisherman. He, that guy's educated. And he would be qualified to be his own rabbi and, and have authority to teach, have authority to have his own disciples. And so um, only the best of the best and a select few were able to move to this next level. A lot of times, uh, culturally, if you were a part of a family that had a priestly line involved in it or synagogue workers, it was a better chance. And most of the time, you had to be of a wealthy family to participate in this next level. And, and a rabbi, once you passed the, all the tests, once you passed this interview process, if he felt like you were worthy to be his disciple, he would come to you and, and invite you formally, and he would say, come and follow me. Come and follow me. It was a cultural phrase. You may have heard that before from Jesus himself saying, come and follow me. He wasn't, he didn't make that up and, or anything like that. And he wasn't literally just saying, hey, come and follow me around. But culturally, people, when they heard that or when the disciples heard that, they would know, oh, he wants me to be the disciple under him, under his teachings. He is the rabbi, and he wants me to be his disciple. That's a big deal. That's a high honor. And so it's interesting when you think of Jesus going around and saying to these disciples, come and follow me. They don't fit the mold for family. You don't want the sons of thunder to be your disciples. They don't fit the mold for wealth. They don't fit the mold for trade. And they don't fit the mold for even education. None of it. And yet Jesus said, come and follow me. I want you as my disciple says a lot more about Jesus than it does the disciples in that moment. A lot of times we can think, man, what great faith. They just left behind everything. Jesus just won them the lottery. They just got the free ticket out of blue collar work. They just got a future that they could have the potential to be a rabbi. Incredible. It's like a free, winning a free ticket to Harvard. That, that is what Jesus was offering. And it's amazing that he offered those type of men. He offered women that same thing. And he offers us that today that we get to be under him, a rabbi like him of his level, to come and follow. And, and, but as the disciples would receive this call, they would know in their minds, Jesus isn't calling them to come and believe in him or just come and have faith in him. 
or come and literally follow him around or just identify with him, they would know if they accepted this invitation, it was rigorous, it was their whole life, and it was years and years of training under Rabbi Jesus. They would know it entails all these things. And, and rabbis and disciples would know in that time, as a disciple, there was four different goals, four goals to accomplish as a disciple from a rabbi. The first one was be with your rabbi, then learn from him, learn his teachings. Then ultimately you wanted to become like your rabbi. And then finally, finally, the goal was to do what your rabbi did to go and teach and make disciples and have disciples. And so I wanna break down with us today the four ways that Jesus is calling us to be disciples. It looks a lot different than we think, doesn't it? When we apply actual context, it's not just saying, hey, come and believe and you're good. Hey, come to church. Hey, just give your money every once. It means a lot more for us when we accept the call that Jesus has given out as an invitation to say, hey, come and follow me. And let's break that down. So the first one, the first goal of our apprenticeship, our disciples, being disciples of Jesus is the first one, be with Jesus, to be with him. A call from a rabbi in that culture, the first step to come and follow was to be with him. They weren't just attending a class every once in a while. It wasn't just a, uh, a little schedule. They would leave everything and they would live with the rabbi. They would travel with him. They would eat with him. They would sleep in the same room. They, would, they literally attached themselves to the rabbi. Following was not a metaphor for them. It was quite literal. It was, I follow this guy around everywhere. And, and it was, in fact, it was a Jewish blessing to bless a disciple by saying, hey, be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Be covered in the dust of your rabbi. It was an amazing blessing to signify, I am literally around this guy all the time. I am close to him. I am, I am with him. It's not part-time, it's not just a hobby, it's not when it's convenient or when it's easy, it, it, it's not when I have time to learn under him, it's I am with him always. I am with him always. And I think, you know, the disciples, they didn't just visit the rabbi, they just didn't attend hanging out with the rabbi, but they lived with him. And I think today, that's why Jesus died for us, isn't it? He died for relationship. He died that we could have a way that our sins are forgiven so that we could have intimacy with him. In fact, then he sent his spirit to live and dwell inside of us, to even be with us more, not just around us, to be inside us more. And so Jesus' goal is to be with you. But can I ask us this morning, are you with him? Are you with him? Jesus is with you all the time, but are you with him? I, I love the phrase, uh, pra, uh, it's being present to God's presence. And when I'm at my work, am I with Jesus? He's with me, but I'm I with him. A, a, am I attentive to that he's present here when I'm going just to run errands, or I'm with family here, or I'm at vacation, or outside of a Sunday or a Wednesday? Am I with Jesus? That's my call to be a disciple, to be with him. He's promised to be with me, but am I, am I focused on being present with him. That's our call. That's our mandate. That's the, that's the minimum that I recognize. He's with me, but that I am with you, Jesus. I'm not just going to visit the presence of God, but I live in it. I live in it, right? So be with Jesus. The second thing that we have as disciples, our goal is to learn from him and learn his teachings. We don't just stop at attending church or, or recognizing I'm with Jesus, Jesus with me, but the next step is I, I wanna learn from him. I know Jesus changed the world upside down. He presented a different way to live, to think, to react, and a different way to be, and I wanna learn as much as I can from him and learn his teachings. You know, disciple, like I said, the, the function of disciple in scripture is better uh, defined as apprentice, but the literal, more literal translation of disciple is learner, is learner. And so I've committed, if I've said yes to Jesus to be his disciple, I have committed to learning. I am never at a place in my walk with Jesus that I know enough. And when I do, that's signal that I don't know anything. Right? I'm never at a place where I can be, I can have enough scripture. I can have enough class. I can have enough Sunday school. I can have enough. I'm never at that level until the day that I meet him face to face. 
I am never at that level. I need to commit to being a lifelong learner, to grow, to become, to, 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 to glean from him. Rabbis of that time and of that culture, they would all have a way that they taught scripture. They would have a certain way that they interpreted it. And they would have a way that then they would say, this is how you walk it. This is the way that you should live in the Torah or the, the, the scriptures, okay? And that, interesting enough, was called the yoke. It was called the rabbi's yoke. And so Jesus, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, verses 30, says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. This brings so much context to this verse, doesn't it? That Jesus wasn't just talking about a piece of farm equipment to say, hey, just be near to me at all times and it'll be good. He's literally saying my way of life, the way that should be lived, the way that you should be, that you are created to live is different than the world. I have flipped it upside down, and it's different, and you need to learn it. Let me teach you because it'll be better for your life. It changes it, doesn't it? He's saying, hey, take my yoke, take my teaching, learn from me. Don't just settle for being a a believer or a follower, but learn and grow because the more you learn, the the more that you know, the more that you grow is the better for your life. It changes you. It changes your life. You, there's no other rabbi on earth that could give you a teaching that would be rest for your soul. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount gave us his yoke that was totally different from anyone else. It was countercultural and it was opposite and it was a way to live, it was a way to think, it was a way to react, it was a way to behave, it it was a way to be. And Jesus' mandate still for us today is I'm committed to knowing fully what he wants, knowing how to live, because it's good for me. Because it's good for me. It's so important to learn. It's so important to get. That's why we plug Sunday school so much. That's why we plug getting in a class where you're learning and growing together. Why? Because it changes you. Sunday school doesn't just fill you up. It changes you. It changes you. And this, with this proposed new schedule we're talking about and getting feedback, why, did, why, we, why do we want to set it up this way? Why is it that we feel like the Lord is calling us to do this? Because we're prioritizing learning Look at our culture today. Look at the signs of the times today. We need to be rooted and standing on foundation and truth more than ever. More than ever. And Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. And I want to be at a place where I, I, I'm not checking off salvation lists or anything just by going, but I am becoming and changing because I'm learning. Because I'm learning from him. Here's why we need to learn more about God's word and to study it. Because God's word is good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness to equip you for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16. I could just stop there. That is enough to, to say I'm all in on continuing to continual, continual learning in my life. I will always be a learner. But it says more. God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, how are you supposed to know where to go without God's word? It makes you prosperous and successful, Joshua 1.8. That's, I want that. I don't know who doesn't. It is the sword of the spirit. It's my weapon to fight, Ephesians 6.17. It's what we live on. Man does not live on bread alone by, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is how we live, Matthew 4.4. 4. It gives us hope. How many of you know we need some hope If you look around, if you look at the news, not much hope, but I could find hope in learning and and learning the teachings that God has in scripture. Hope, it's the truth that sets us free. John eight, it's perfect and revives the soul. Psalm 19, it's not just to check a box off of your life, but it changes your whole life when you commit to learning, growing, focusing. That's why we say, please, we implore you, Sunday school is for you. It's for your benefit. It's for your good. I was talking to my wife about this sermon, and she said, man, I don't know, like, 
She's like, Sunday school is so good. And I was like, yeah, I'm preaching on that a little bit. I, you're preaching the choir. She's like, but I don't just, I don't understand why more people don't take advantage of it. I'm like, I know. And she's like, because they make it so easy for us. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, people do the hard work of learning and training and making these things, you know, digestible and bite-sized enough where you can show up to a class and they've done the hard work to present you to help you learn better, to help you grow. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, I'm going to use that in my sermon. That's amazing that people are working hard to provide and, and teachers and, and, and pastors or whatever are providing these things. We should take advantage, not just because we should, but because we need it. You don't know Jesus if you don't know the Bible. You don't know how to follow God if you don't know the Bible. You don't know how to worship God unless you know the Bible. You don't know the Holy Spirit and what he is saying unless you know the Bible. You don't know yourself unless you know the Bible. You don't know truth from lies unless you know the Bible. And you don't know spiritual disciplines and how to walk this out if you don't know the Bible. Sounds like I should know the Bible. Sounds like I should get all that I can in learning what Jesus has for me in his yoke. We need it more than ever to be lifelong learners. I always need to be learning more. And I'll never truly learn or know enough that'll justify stop to stop learning. And so maybe for you, you're sitting here today and saying, man, I need to, I need to commit to learning. That's one thing that I was praying for this morning for you that the Holy Spirit would say, hey, this is good for you. It's not, it's, it shouldn't be an obligation that I should, oh, well, Pastor Luke told me I should. No, it should be, I need this. We all need it. Whether you've been serving Jesus for 50 years or this is your first Sunday and you don't know what the heck is going on, well, thank you for coming, but you need it too, right? We all need this. The third thing, so be with Jesus, learn from him and his teachings. The third is to become like him. Become like Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18. So all of us who have that so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. I love that. Changed into his glorious image. It's one of the Holy Spirit's jobs to change us and mold us and shape us into more like Jesus, to have growth and progress and, and building us and, and changing us. And that's what we can get only by being with our rabbi and learning from him. You cannot become like Jesus if you're not learning from him and being with him. And, and if the more you learn about him, the more you become like him. And our goal is to be like Jesus. If there's an area of my life that I don't look like Jesus in, I need to be with him more and I need to learn more to how to be like him. You know what I'm saying? There's never an area that in our life that's just excusable, that's like, yeah, that's okay. I mean, at least in the other areas. No, no, every part of me, the Holy Spirit wants to change and grow into God's glorious image. That's his goal. That's his goal for our lives. And so I know people, I've, I've heard people have been frustrated not being able to, you know, have come to me in confidence and counseling and I can't do this or this, I have a hard time. It's like, you don't know, we, we don't know, if you don't know how to follow Jesus in that way, don't expect to become like him. I need, I need, but I need to become like him. Like I said, Sunday school, it's, it changes you. Learning more about God changes you. That's my goal. And here's the thing today, this morning, you may be asking, well, am I, am I really, like, have I committed to that as a disciple in this context that Pastor Luke is talking about? Am I, have I committed to, to being discipled by Jesus and learning from him? And am I being discipled? That's the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is, who or what is discipling me? You are always becoming somebody. You are always being discipled, trained, taught by someone or something in your life. You and I have the choice. Is that someone or something, God and his spirit, or is it the world? Is it what entertains me? Is it trauma from the past? Is it family members? Is it history? Do you see what I'm saying? We're always being trained and taught by someone or something. Why don't we commit to being discipled by Jesus in everything that we do, in every part of my life? Unfortunately, in, in 
Western culture, we have a lot of Christians who don't look like Jesus. That doesn't even make sense. We have a lot of Christians that claim, I, I believe and I follow, but they don't look anything like him. And we can't just have the end goal of just knowing more. We have to have the end goal of becoming more. Jesus isn't just someone we believe in. He's somebody that we become. He's someone we become. Ephesians 5, 1 says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Imitate him, become like him. But all these three things, you could, you could normally say, great, be with him, learn from him, become him, awesome. Great three-point sermon, Pastor Luke, let's go home, we're done, that's amazing, I'm gonna be a better disciple. That's not the end goal. There's one more, because a rabbi of that time, his goal, why he picked so wisely is because he was saying, is this person capable, do they have the potential to carry my yoke and then start teaching and making disciples of their own? That was his end goal. It wasn't just for them to look like him, but them to train and make other disciples. Jesus himself said in John 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Our end goal is to do what Jesus did. To do what the teacher did, ultimately that implies then we become teachers. You know the Great Commission in Matthew 28? Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We love to end that there and say, great, I'm gonna go and make disciples. Verse 20 says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus himself outlines that me going and making disciples, now I have become by his spirit a rabbi in a sense where people, I get to go and make disciples and I teach them. I teach them, I train them, I make them, I mold them. That was the goal and disciples knew that when they accepted the call to come and follow under a rabbi, that's what they wanted to ultimately do is make disciples themselves. But I, unfortunately, I think in Western Christianity, we've seen a full generation or full multiple generations of Christians that just stop at becoming like Jesus, not making and teaching and going. That's the end goal of being a disciple. And there, that, that it would be silly of us to think, man, I'm gonna go through all this training, all this apprenticeship, being with Jesus, learning from him, all this work, it would be silly to not apply that and go and do. It would be silly for a plumber to go through all that and not go and do. That, would, that wouldn't make any sense. And, and, and in fact, that would in my, when I was praying for this, the, the word that came to my mind was useless. It's useless. If I'm not ultimately going and doing and making and teaching, what's the point? It's useless. And in the Bible, I'm reminded that God doesn't like useless. Listen to what he says about useless things. The useless branch that doesn't produce fruit gets cut off and burned. The useless piece of salt that doesn't change things gets thrown out. The useless water, it's not hot or cold, it's useless. It gets spit out, it makes him sick. The useless servant gets cut out and tossed aside and punished. God doesn't like useless. He doesn't. He wants to use you. He wants to use you by his spirit. He wants you, he's commanded it to go and make. And being with Jesus and learning from him and becoming like him, they don't mean anything unless I'm going and making and going and doing. That's the whole point of this discipleship under Jesus, that's the whole point. And making disciples is the natural, rather the, rather the supernatural overflow of being a disciple. Making disciples means, or, or being disciple means making disciples. That's what it means. My end goal out into the world of the Great Commission isn't get to just walk someone for the sinner's prayer. Absolutely necessary, they need salvation, they, they like come to Jesus, we, we need salvation. But that's not my end goal. My end goal is ultimately to make disciples who make disciples. That's why the, 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 the theory of the kingdom of God isn't addition, it's multiplication. 
I don't just add one, I, I multiply. Jesus has multiplied his disciples and he's called us to do the same when we accept that. Every Christian should be helping unbelievers become believers, but every Christian should be helping other believers grow more in maturity. Also, every Christian should be seeking out other believers to help them grow in maturity, every one of them, all of the above. And when I ask what is discipleship, we can, is it a program? Absolutely. Is it a class? Yes. Is it a small group growing in maturity? Absolutely. Is it a mentor or a mentee relationship? Yes. Is it learning, serving, stepping out more? Absolutely it is. Is it evangelism? Yes. Is it helping and supporting, encouraging someone? Absolutely. Is it a confession of sin to somebody else to get prayer for healing? Absolutely it is. My point is discipleship and being a disciple is a lot more than we like to make it out to be. In fact, I know in my own life I've done this. If I can just put discipleship and being a disciple and regulate that to a class, that'll check my little disciple box and then I don't have to do anything else. It causes me to go, I can forget the rest. I don't have to make disciples, I'm being a disciple. It doesn't even make sense that way. Disciples make disciples. Worship team, would you come? Did you know the latest study that is that 70% of Americans identify as Christian? 70%. It causes me to think, if 70% of our nation was Christian, wouldn't you think our nation would look a little bit differently? The majority of our nation is Christian? I think it would look differently. So that causes me to question again, are these people Christians? Are they disciples? Because disciples look a lot different than the Christians that I'm seeing around our, our nation. And unfortunately, the word Christian is pretty meaningless now. I know when I go out and, you know, I get in a conversation, people ask me what I do. I'm a pastor. Oh, I'm a Christian. And like some of them, I'm like, really? That's cool. And I don't say that as a judgment thing at all. It actually breaks my heart because they're missing out on the life that God has called them to live that's gonna benefit them the most and the people around them. American Christianity, in fact, just simply means I believe in God, I'm a semi-moral person, and I go to church every once in a while. American Christianity means Jesus follows me around more than I follow him. He better get on my level, my schedule, my plan, to bless me, to help me with some I need. He's someone I support more of a fan. My point is that Western Christianity has made it so that you can be a Christian but not a disciple. And that is not biblical. That's not what Jesus said. There, there's no multiple levels to this at all. Oh, I just, I become a convert and a believer and then I'll be a disciple. And once I can figure that out, then I'll be a disciple maker. That's not what Jesus said. That's not how he outlined it in scripture and that's not how he lived it. Jesus' call wasn't come and believe and someday go to heaven. His call was come and follow, which implied all of those four things, including you yourself going and making. There was no differentiation in scripture between a believer and a disciple. It didn't exist. It wasn't in their context. When they signed up and accepted the call to follow Jesus, it meant everything. They were responsible for all four parts. And the disciples knew that when they said yes. They knew what a disciple looked like. And I'm challenging us today, do we know what a real disciple looks like? And are we committed to that? All four of those things. In fact, the term Christian is only used in the Bible three times. Three times the word Christian is used. And every time it's a outsider talking about Christians, but it's used as a, as a slur. It was, it, was a, it was a diss, it was, it, it, was not, it was a derogatory term. You know how many times disciple was used in the New Testament alone? 268. There's no difference. Disciple, follower, all of these things. It's not just by belief, but by action. You know who was a really great Christian in scripture but not an apprentice? Judas. He was around Jesus, literally followed him, picked up the call, lived with him, traveled with him. He learned, he sat under his teaching. 
but at somewhere in the line, he did not fully commit. He wasn't making disciples and he wasn't becoming like Jesus. And I think he had a lifestyle, he had a pattern, he had a routine with Jesus, but it wasn't this relationship that has committed to being a full disciple. It's important that we go and do, go and make. It's important that we become. It's important that we learn. It's important, it's necessary that we be with Jesus. I preach into the choir this morning because this church is blessed. Why? Because we have a bunch of people that have committed to that. But my challenge for you this morning is would you let the Holy Spirit speak to the parts of your life to say, do I favor one over the other? Am I neglecting one of those four pieces completely? Is there something I need to recommit to because I've answered the call, come and follow. And if you're in this place and you haven't even answered that call, it's a beautiful life. It's a beautiful life that Jesus has extended this graceful and merciful call and invitation to come and follow him and be his disciple. What an honor. What a joy. Would you stand all across this place? Does your life look like a disciple or just a follower? Here's the thing. You can choose whether or not to follow Jesus. It's our choice. It's our free will. We can choose to follow Jesus or not. But once we have chosen to follow him, we do not get to choose what following Jesus looks like. I don't get to choose how I follow Jesus. He's outlined it in scripture. He's spoken it, he's called it, and that's what I follow. All four of those things. In fact, with Peter, the first thing Jesus ever said to Peter was follow me, come and follow me. Do you know what the last thing Jesus ever said to Peter personally? Come and follow me. It just screams that Jesus is saying, hey, no matter where you're at, we're always supposed to be disciples. Whether you're serving me for a long time, whether you just got off a failure, whatever it may be, you are a disciple. You have answered the call. You have answered the call. Would you bow your heads for just a second? I wanna give us time. Just just for a couple minutes and, and we're gonna sing a song that says, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. That means something different now because following means something different. It means a full disciple. And if you're in this place and you haven't taken up that call to start, I wanna give you an opportunity. I wanna pray for you quick. And if there's anyone in this room that would say, yes, Jesus, I'm answering that call for the first time. I wanna follow you. I wanna be your disciple. I need you you as my savior and my Lord and my master. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray with you, pray over you. That means for us. Oh, absolutely. I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for your salvation, your grace, and your mercy. And thank you for the beautiful invitation to come and follow you, to be with you, learn from you, and ultimately become and do what you did. God, we pray for this hand. God, bless her in the name of Jesus as she commits to following you. For the rest of us in this place, that means you have answered that call. That means you are a disciple. My prayer this morning, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Give him something. Maybe you're holding something back out of fear or whatever it may be. The Holy Spirit's going to speak to you right now. And as we sing this song, I pray that it would not be just a song that you sing. Or just This is just what we do. We sing at the end. But it would be your next statement of faith and recommitment to say, I am a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not turning back. No matter how hard, no matter how sacrificial, no matter what comes against me, I will follow. I have chosen that. Can we do that? Let me pray and then we'll sing that. Jesus, we thank you for the disciples in this place. Thank you for the followers that you've called. God, thank you that you don't just leave us out to dry. You sent your spirit to equip us, that you're always with us, God. I pray that you call us to new levels, God, of commitment to you. God, call us to new levels of even going out and teaching and making God. Thank you that you've trusted and entrusted us with your spirit so that we may go and do, Father. We, we give you our lives this morning. We, we love you in your mighty name. Amen. Would you, would you declare this with me?